Gévaudan, southeastern France, October 1764. In the mountainous countryside, where farmhouses lie miles apart and ravines swallow the unwary, a killer lurks. Those who have seen it claim it is a great beast, like a wolf, but much larger. Others say it can run on water and jump 10-foot walls. And attack survivors claim it has shining eyes, it can speak like a man, and it walks on hind legs that end in hooves. Though survivors might disagree on exactly what it looks like, everyone knows how the beast kills. It ambushes shepherds and drovers as they take the animals out to pasture, preying selectively on women and teenagers. In September, it killed one 36-year-old woman mere steps from her front door. And this month, a woman was found decapitated. It took a week to find her head. And this is only the beginning, for the beast of Gévaudan will keep killing, no matter what hunters, the army, and even the king himself do to try and stop it. Thanks so much to NordVPN for sponsoring today's historical horror story. To take control of your internet security, save 68% off a two-year plan, and get one month free, use code EXTRACREDITS at nordvpn.com slash extracredits. In the summer of 1764, the rural province of Givaudan began battling a monster. In an escalating series of incidents, an unknown animal, or animals, attacked over 300 local peasants, killing over 100 of them and spurring mass panic. Yet at first, no one noticed the pattern. Wolf attacks were not uncommon in rural France. In fact, some historians estimate there were hundreds of deaths a year due to the animals, including occasional outbreaks of attacks that might kill 10 or 20 people before dying away again. So when the bodies of two teenaged shepherdesses and one shepherd were found mutilated in the fields that summer, the locals simply dismissed it as part of the harsh landscape of peasant life. But then it kept happening. And not just to the child and teenaged livestock handlers, but also to adult women. And the ferocity of these injuries was stunning. The animal attacked the head and throat, on occasion so viciously that it decapitated its victims. At times, it even carried off small children in its jaws, snatching them as their mothers worked in the garden. And because firearms were rare, most peasants could only defend themselves with farming tools. But even so, farmers organized wolf hunts armed with shovels and pickaxes. However, the more contact the locals had with wolves, the more the stories grew. They said it was impervious to bullets, that it had a head like a greyhound and six claws on each foot, that it was a werewolf or witch. A local priest even claimed it was God's punishment for losing the Seven Years' War to Protestant England. But one thought permeated all of these theories. The culprit of these attacks was not many wolves, the populace increasingly agreed. It was one great beast. The Beast. A local official, Etienne Elephant, recommended that women and children only go to their fields in the company of armed men, but his advice was impractical. Givaudan was still a feudal agrarian economy, and at the best of times, farmers barely made enough to pay their landlords and sustain themselves, meaning that the older men had to handle the crops, while the women and children had to take the stock to pasture themselves. So the killing accelerated. Eight attacks in eight days, with four fatalities, two of the victims were decapitated, and some completely shredded. So La Font called in the army. Captain Jean-Baptiste Duhamel was a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and like the nation of France itself, was struggling to dispel the feeling of dishonor brought on by defeat. So in November of 1764, he descended on the province with a company of dragoons, patrolling and organizing hunts. He collected descriptions and used maps to determine the best way to patrol for the beast. Worry not, was his message. The army is here. Yet for three months, Duhamel's troops simply couldn't catch the creature. Once, he even had the beast in his sights, but his soldiers spooked it before he could fire. So, in February of 1765, he organized a hunt with a new tactic. 20,000 peasants, some too malnourished to stand after leaving their crops unharvested, came to assist, to beat the brush, and drive the beast towards his men. But the beast slipped across a river, escaping through a gap in the screen that one village had neglected to guard. The villagers claimed dubiously that they had been at their posts, but the beast just shrugged off their bullets. As the months stretched and Duhamel's embarrassment grew, he himself began promoting stories of the beast's enormous size and seemingly supernatural powers. It was a handy excuse for failure. And that's when the press started to take notice. Barred from reporting on politics, the French press often fixated on stories of violence in the provinces. The gorier the better. This story was perfect. French heroes hunting a monster, women and children being torn apart, 
Newspapers in Paris published exhaustive articles and gory illustrations said to be of the beast. Also, naturalists in Paris, exercising a new interest in taxonomy and classification, tried to unwind the mystery based on descriptions. Many claimed the beast was a hyena, escaped from a noble's menagerie. Others said it was a bizarre hybrid between a lion and leopard, or a dog-wolf hybrid. Even King Louis XV took notice, particularly after a young boy, Jacques Portufet, attacked the beast with a bayonet when it tried to carry off his friend. The king gave Portufet a reward and sent him to school at the crown's expense. Then later, another peasant hero, a pregnant mother named Jean Varlet, won fame for battling the beast barehanded, then stabbing it with a lance as it tried to drag away her six-year-old son. Duhamel, meanwhile, was becoming more desperate. He left out poisoned meat, began using bodies of victims as bait, and even planned to dress up his dragoons as women to invite an attack. He craved the glory of killing the beast. Meanwhile, the news went international. Newspapers in London and Boston kept pace with stories, and one satirical article in Britain claimed that the beast had swallowed the whole French army and mocked France's failure to kill it. At this point, the king decided to get directly involved and dispatched a pair of famous wolf hunters from Normandy whose tactics of poisoning victims' bodies and laying them out as bait got them run out of town. Next came King Louis' personal gun-bearer and master of the hunt, François Antoine, along with a party of huntsmen and King Louis' own wolf-hunting dogs. In contrast to the wolf hunters, he and his team treated the villagers with respect and partnered with them. And also unlike the previous hunters, he found the beast. September 20th, 1765. There had been a wolf sighted here yesterday. Big, with a female and pups. Francois Antoine waits for the hunting party to beat the animal out of the woods, his musket quadruple loaded with powder, a single ball and shot. After what feels like an eternity, he sees the wolf emerge. It's so big, he briefly mistakes it for a donkey. He shoulders his musket, aims. The beast notices the movement and turns his head. He fires, staggering at the blast, but felling the creature with a hit to the eye. Collecting himself, he steps forward to inspect his kill, to see this monster up close. The beast rears, stumbling and lunging toward him, going into a full charge. He can't reload in time, and just as Antoine seemingly accepts his fate, his companion fires a second shot. Upon impact, the creature slows, still walking towards him, then collapses. The beast of Givoudan is dead. Francois Antoine had the creature's skin mounted and brought it to court, returning in triumph, but the reception was lukewarm. Because it was just a wolf. I mean, a big wolf, for sure, but everyone did expect a hyena or a lion or some sort of monster. Still, King Louis was happy to bring this increasingly embarrassing episode to a close. He gave Antoine a purse of money, along with a title, and declared the whole thing over. <sighs> Except it wasn't. Two months later, the killings resumed. Was there more than one beast? Had a pup escaped? Or was Antoine's wolf simply not the right one? The crown offered no more support, because according to the official line, the beast was dead. But the terror stretched on for another year and a half, only stopping when a local woodsman, Jean Chastel, shot a wolf as it emerged from a thicket during a hunt. Attack survivors claimed that this, not the earlier beast, was the true culprit. Local doctors made extreme claims about its anatomy and developed folklore, claiming Chastel had shot it with a silver bullet. Stories also say Chastel tried to bring the corpse to Louis, but by the time they arrived, it had rotted and stank, so the king callously ordered it buried. But this kind of made sense. It was a subversion of the official narrative, promoting a local hero over the outsider Antoine, who represented a government that had abandoned them even as more people died in the fields. But regardless, the killings were finally over. So, what exactly was the beast? The most likely explanation is there was no single beast. Givaudan was just overpopulated with wolves. In fact, rashes of wolf attacks, with 20 deaths at a time, happened almost every decade in France. They'd even caused smaller panics in the past, but ones that went unnoticed by the press in Paris. Which, in an odd roundabout way, proves that the beast was more than just wolves. It was the creation of rural folklore and the urban press. Religious panic and enlightenment thought, and peasant fear and misery taken up as a hobby by the elite. In other words, the wolves did the killing, but we made the monster. Happy Halloween, everyone.
Once again, thanks so much to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode. If you want to protect your totally normal and not at all spooky internet history, then you've got to give NordVPN a try. With thousands of servers in over 60 countries, military-grade onion over-encryption technology, and a user-friendly lightweight Chrome extension, even an 18th century wolf-fearing peasant could be securely browsing in seconds. Voila! Plus, if you act now and use the code extra credits at nordvpn.com slash extra credits, you'll get 68% off a two-year plan. That's under four bucks a month for 24 months if you're doing the math with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you'll receive a extra month of double encrypted protection absolutely free. So secure your online self with NordVPN and never be scared about your internet security again. We see you, Ahmed Ziad, Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.